Hello and welcome to Miniature Game Montage. As the Enforcers heal up from their last battle with the Corpse Grinder cult, I thought it would be a good time to make a video on how to play Necromunda. I would love to tell you it's an easy game, and at its core, it is, but there's a lot of ambiguous rules scattered around different books, and often it gets hard to remember. You'll see that in my reports for sure. As a note, I will be using the rulebook from the Dark Uprising box set. A quick shout out to the folks over at yaktribe.games. They have nothing to do with this video, but they're an excellent source of reference material. They have numerous templates where you can create and manage gangs, as well as a forum to help with rules questions. We're going to break this down into segments, and timestamps will be in the description if you want to skip forward. So what do you need to play? First and foremost, you will need some basic tools to play the game of Necromunda. You'll need a measuring tape, you'll need some six-sided dice for rolling those critical hits and wounds, you'll need some special injury dice that represent what happens when a fighter goes down, you'll need some ammo dice for what happens to the weapons you fire, scatter dice and templates for special weapons you may bring, and some various tokens to help you keep track of everything that's happening on the battlefield. Next, let's talk about how to build a gang. Gangs are represented by your miniatures on the tabletop. There's a composition to follow, such as every gang needs to have a leader, every gang can have champions, which are slightly upgraded characters to your mainstay models, which are called gangers. You can also have juves, which are often less skilled members of the crew. The types of members you take and the equipment you give them are paid for with credits, or you can think of those as points. Necromunda can be played in various ways, either by agreeing to a credit limit, such as a thousand credits per side, or by rolling it up based on the scenario, such as D3 plus 7. If you're new to creating gangs, I will again recommend the folks over at yaktribe.games. They have some terrific resources for building and managing gangs. I would recommend printing out some cards for your gang members so you can keep track of their equipment and statuses throughout the game. It's also helpful for a quick reference at their equipment and how to use it. Now some of these cards are being shown on the screen now, and let's take a look at these a little more in depth. For today's demo, we'll be looking at the Corpse Grinder Cult with Mephisto and Festermite. Mephisto will be a ganger in this demo, and Festermite will be a juve. Looking at their cards, it's an easy way to keep track of your gang members. Looking specifically at Mephisto in the top left, we can see he has a movement of 5 inches, a weapon skill of 3+, plus, which means he's good in close combat, a ballistic skill of 5+, plus for shooting, a strength of 3, a toughness of 3, he has 1 wound, and an initiative of 4 up. Lastly, he has 1 attack. For the 4 values on the right, these are 2d6 tests. He has a leadership of 7, a cool of 7, a willpower of 8, and an intelligence of 9. We'll get into more details on those later. He's equipped with a Butcher's Chain Cleaver and Butcher's Cleaver. The first S and L under range denote the range in inches to be qualified for short range and long range. The E specifies that this is a close combat only weapon. The next S and L under accuracy denotes any bonus for attacking at that range, and we'll cover that in a minute. The weapons have a strength of S plus one, that means it takes the base model's strength of 3 and adds plus 1 for a total of 4. The AP value is where we see our first difference on these weapons. The Butcher's Chain Cleaver is AP minus 2, where the Butcher's Cleaver is minus 1. The AP of a weapon reduces the opponent's armor save. So a wound with the Butcher's Cleaver, for example, will make a 3 plus save a 5 plus save for their opponent due to AP of minus 2. The Butcher's Cleaver, however, would give them a 4-up save due to the AP only being minus 1. Additional key information you see is the damage done by each wound, such as 2 for the Butcher's Chain Cleaver, and the ammo check score, which is null because those weapons don't shoot. There are some special rules associated with most weapons, and we'll cover some of those at a later time. For war gear, you again have various options to take, but we're sticking with the basics that comes with the gangers. A skinner's mask and plate mail. A quick look at Festermite, and you can see how different the stats are compared to Mephisto. 
He's not as good in close combat, but better at shooting. Being a Juve, he also has a worse leadership and willpower rating. This will vary by gang. He's equipped with a boning sword, which is a close combat weapon. It is user strength and AP minus two with two damage. He has an auto pistol with a short range of four inches and a long range of 12 inches. It gets plus one to hit at short range. It has a strength of three with one damage and a four plus ammo check. I also gave him frag grenades so we can see how those work with the blast special rule. He's also equipped with an initiate's mask and flak armor. In total, we have 195 points for the Corpse Grinder Cult. For the Enforcers, we have Slick and Double Tap. They clock in at 230 points, which is more than the Corpse Grinders, but hey, we're just having fun. You can see Slick's profile, and he is decent at close combat and shooting. His leadership, cool, willpower, and intelligence are all sevens. He is equipped with a stub gun, which is standard for the Enforcers. He also has a grenade launcher that comes with various ammo. He is also equipped with an assault shield, which counts as a melee weapon while providing good defense. Double Tap is playing our Juve in this demo, and you can see his statistics are slightly worse than Slick. He is equipped with a stub gun and a shotgun with various types of ammunition. Now that we've got our gang figured out, let's go to the tabletop. All right, here we see the setup with the Enforcers, Double Tap, and Slick over in the top left and the Corpse Grinder Cult with Mephisto and Festermite uh, here at the bottom. The game of Necromunda is broken down into three phases, priority, action, and end phase. We'll cover each one in detail. In the priority phase, players roll off to determine who gets priority or the ever important first move. In the case of a tie, priority passes to the person who didn't have it last. Since that can't apply on our first turn if you tie, you just simply roll again. Dice rolls are coming out now for priority, with the enforcers and the black dice are up for turn one. With priority decided, you'll next place ready markers next to your fighters. It doesn't matter what their status is, everyone receives a ready marker if they're on the tabletop. And just like that, we're moving to the action phase. The first step in the action phase is fleeing the battlefield. This applies if a gang failed a bottle test in the previous turn. Each fighter would be required to take a cool check on 2d6 before they can activate. Since this is the first turn, everyone is ready and we can move on to the next step, which is activate fighters. Starting with the player with priority, a fighter will be activated by removing their ready marker. You can change the facing of your fighter for free at that time. The bulk of the game consists of doing two actions with your fighter. There are three types of actions, basic, simple, and double. A fighter may make a combination of two simple actions, such as a move, two basic actions as long as the choices are different. For example, shooting is a basic action and you can't do that twice. You may make a simple and basic action, such as a move and shoot, or you may make one double action, such as a charge. Basic actions are the most common and as previously stated can't be duplicated. Each action must be fully resolved before moving on to the next one. Some examples of basic actions are to take cover, shoot, aim, loot, or retreat. Simple actions are simple things such as movement, reloading a weapon, operating most doors, or giving someone a coup de grace, which will be covered later. If your fighter happens to be on the ground or prone, it would take a basic action to stand up. You may do some things while on the ground, but we won't cover those in detail here. A quick side note about Necromunda is measuring. Pre-measuring is not allowed, so you have to state your action before measuring to see if it works or not. And with all that said, let's see some action on the tabletop. Since the Enforcer's one priority, Double Tap will activate first, and he will do a five inch move up the stairs. Since he has no targets to shoot at, and he doesn't want to leave himself vulnerable, he will move an additional five inches and get into cover. This will use up two of his actions, which were both simple. The turn will then go over to the Corpse Grinder Cult, and Festermite will activate first, and he will move his standard five inches. 
It's okay to move through your models as long as you don't end on top of them. So Festermite will move to the top of the stairs. He will see double tap and use his second action to fire. Looking from the model's eye view, we establish cover and we can clearly see that double tap is more than 50% obscured. That's gonna give him full cover and will add plus two to the roll needed to hit. So Festermite, looking at his card, normally hits on a four plus. He would now be hitting on a six plus. With range established, Festermite is okay to take a shot, equaling the number of attacks that he has on his card, which is one. He will also roll an ammo dice to see if an ammo check is needed and to check if his weapon does the rapid fire special rule. These ammo dice are required to be rolled when you're firing weapons, even if you're firing them in close combat. On a roll less than six, the shot misses and no ammo check is required. Had this symbol been rolled on the ammo dice, Festermite would need to take an ammo check equal to the rating on his card, which is a four plus. If he failed that roll, the weapon would be out of ammo and have to be reloaded at some point before it could be fired again. With the turn going back over to the enforcers, Slick will activate and do a five inch move up the stairs where he can't draw line of sight to Festermite. Slick is armed with a grenade launcher with the blast special rule, however. That means that he can pick a spot on the board that he has line of sight to and fire at that spot. For his second action, which is basic, Slick is gonna fire his grenade launcher in frag mode, targeting the side of the obstacle that he can see. And looking at his card, he needs fours to hit. Now, blast weapons work a bit differently than non-blast weapons. If you roll a hit, then anything under the template where you placed it will be hit. But if you happen to miss, you're gonna have to roll a scatter dice, which we see here and then roll a d6, and that shot will scatter in the direction of the dice a number of inches rolled on the d6. We also wanna be sure that we take an ammo check on this roll. Anything under the template in its new resting place will take hits and we'll show how to resolve those once it happens. The good thing about going second is you can often move into place and hope to get initiative next turn. Mephisto is going to do that, moving up behind cover and hoping to win priority for the next turn. With all fighters for both sides activated, we now move to the end phase. The first step of the end phase is to make a bottle test if necessary. That's only necessary if someone goes down with a serious injury or is taken out of action. The second thing we wanna do is make recovery tests for seriously injured fighters to see if they get back up and continue fighting. And the third thing we wanna do is make rally tests for any broken fighters. We will cover broken fighters, bottle test, and everything else as it happens. Priority rolls for turn two are going out with the enforcers in the black die, and the enforcers will go first. Ready tokens are put down for each fighter, and Slick is going to activate first for the enforcers. He is going to use a basic action to aim, and his second basic action to shoot his frag grenade again. He will be targeting Mephisto, who he has line of sight to, and the template will also get Festermite under it as well. We will follow the similar rules to last time, but because he aimed this time as one of his basic actions, he gets a plus one to hit. So his ballistic skill, instead of needing fours, now goes to needing a three to hit. Due to Mephisto being in cover, the actual roll needed to hit is a five. And I think one of the ways around this is to target the ground in front of them. The next thing that we need to do is roll to wound. So after any target has been hit, whether it has been ranged or in combat, we roll to wound, and the way that that works is you compare the strength of your weapon versus the target's toughness. In this particular example, the frag grenade is a strength three, and both Mephisto and Festermite have a toughness of three. The roll to wound needed is four, and the way that that works is if the strength is greater than your target's toughness, you need threes. If it's double the target's toughness, you need twos, and if it's less than your target's toughness, you need fives. These dice roll out now with Festermite in black, and both fail to wound. Now, because these targets were hit, they are going to be what we call pinned. They will be turned face up and they will be knocked back. And that is a special rule that is on the grenade launcher. It will knock them back an inch. They will be pinned. That means that they will have to spend a basic action to stand up before doing anything else. So while the result for Slick was not ideal, it was still effective. Festermite will activate for the Corpse Grinders. He will use a basic action to stand up and get back to his feet. His second basic action will be to lob a grenade. 
When using blast weapons, you do need to have line of sight to where you're throwing them to, and it doesn't always have to be to a model. The hope here in throwing this grenade is Festermite wants it to scatter, and scatter towards double tap to do damage. In order to find out the range of your grenade, you look at the card, and it says S times 3. That means you take the base strength of your model, which is 3, multiply by 3, and that is the maximum range that you can toss the grenade. Festermite's found his spot, and now he is throwing the grenade, needing a 4 to hit. The shot misses, and because this grenade has the grenade special rule, it means you have to immediately take an ammo check. If failed, you're out of ammo. That was his first and last grenade. He rolls up the scatter die to see where it goes. It is a hit. Now you roll a die here because on a one, something goes wrong and it could hit you. On a roll of two through six, the shot's a dud and the template's removed. Double tap will activate next and move with a simple action. He will then shoot with a basic action with his enforcer shotgun. He decides to target Festermite due to only having partial cover. He normally hits on fives. Partial cover means he needs sixes. There are no bonuses for range and the shot misses. Mephisto activates using a basic action to stand up, remembering that he was blasted back an inch from the grenade. He then uses a simple action to move back into cover. Necromunda has a rule that you cannot go within one inch of a fighter unless you're doing a double action charge move. There are a few different rules that can manipulate that, but that's the general rule of thumb. You have to stay an inch away from someone unless you're doing a double charge move. At the end of round two, there are no bottle checks required, no recovery tests that need to be made. So we will ready up fighters, roll for priorities going out now, and we're ready for round three. With the enforcers winning priority, Double Tap says, no guts, no glory. He does a simple move and decides to shoot his shotgun point blank at Mephisto. Normally hitting on fives, he is short range and gets a plus one to hit. And that means he needs fours. So he's got a 50-50 shot and he rolls that up and oh dear mephisto will use a double action to charge into double tap and i can tell you from experience this is going to be brutal mephisto is swinging a butcher's chain cleaver that will roll in red and a butcher's cleaver that will roll in black he gets one attack and then he gets one extra for a charge he gets one extra die for having uh, two melee weapons and then he also has a special skill called Berserker's Fury that gives him one additional attack when he is on a double action charge move. Now when you're attacking with multiple weapons, the rules say that you need to split those dice as evenly as possible, unless you're firing a pistol. If you're firing a pistol, you only get one shot with that pistol, but since these are both cleavers, melee weapons, um, these are going to be split two and two, with the red die being the Butcher's Chain Cleaver. I should also mention if you're firing the, that pistol in close combat that your short range modifiers do not apply and you still need to roll an ammo dice. So four dice are rolled in total, needing threes to hit for the weapon skill, and these all hit. Now the roll to wound, these are strength plus one, so strength four, toughness three means you need threes to wound, and three out of the four wound. Now you'll notice I only rolled two armor saves here, and that is because flak armor on the enforcers with their armored undersuit only gives them a five up save. The butcher's chain cleaver is minus two AP, so that is going to do damage no matter what. So I roll up for the butcher's cleaver because it's minus one AP. They normally save on a five, but right now they need sixes, and he fails both with snake eyes. That means we're going to roll four injury dice. And we're rolling four injury dice because this rookie patrolman only has one wound. And when you go down to zero wounds, you roll an injury die. We're rolling two for the butcher's chain cleaver because it does two damage. And they were rolling one each for the regular butcher's cleaver that went through and he failed the armor save. So a total of four injury dice are rolled. He goes down with a serious injury. And then Mephisto is going to get what is called a free coup de gras. So because he defeated this guy in hand-to-hand -hand combat and significantly severely injured him he gets to just freely take him out of the game and finish him off and then consolidate you can consolidate two inches and he will do so back into cover now an example i didn't show on that last charge was how it actually works and how it actually works is slick will declare a charge against mephisto right here he can't measure so he's not sure if he's going to make it into contact or not but the rules say that you roll a d3 that rolls up and you add whatever that result is to your base movement. So if you roll a one or a two, you get to move six inches. If your base move is five, if you roll a three or four, you get to move seven inches. And if you roll a five or six, you get to move eight inches. So roll that up and I score a six inch move 
which does not bring me into base-to-base -base contact with Mephisto. However, you still have to carry out the move and go as far as possible staying one inch away from your opponents. If you don't make it into base-to-base -base contact, you stay one inch away. Festermite will then activate using a simple move up and then he will shoot at Slick, normally needing a four on his ballistic skill. He needs threes due to short range. So he rolls that up, he gets a three. It is a rapid fire weapon. Rapid fire weapons work when you roll the ammo dice. Depending on how many bullet holes it has, it can have one, two, or three. That is how many hits you get if you successfully hit your target. In this case, the hit that I rolled was off camera, but it was a three. It only had one bullet hole on it, so that is only one hit. We then bring in wound rolls, strength three versus toughness three, so fours are needed. The assault shield then gives plus two to his save, giving him a three up armor save, which easily passes. The target was hit, however, so he will be pinned, limiting his actions for future turns. Now, because the enforcers had someone taken out of action that turn, they would need to take a bottle test at the end of this turn. So what you do is you roll a d6, and you add to that the total number of fighters that are either seriously injured or out of action, and if the result of that is higher than the number of fighters that you started the game with, then your crew has bottled out. In this particular demo, I started the game with two fighters on the enforcer's side, so I would need to roll a 1 on a d6, add 1 for the fighter that was taken out of action to equal 2, anything above that, and my crew would bottle out. And what bottling out means is they will be testing at the start of the activation phase. Every fighter will take a cool check test, and if that test has failed on 2d6, they are fleeing the battlefield. Now one thing to keep in mind is that your leader, if they pass their cool check, your leader will spread that around within 12 inches to other fighters and allow them to automatically pass their cool checks as well. A champion will do that with a 6 inch bubble. Some other things we did not cover in this demo would be nerve tests. When a fighter goes down with a serious injury, if there are any other fighters within three inches, such as when Double Tap went down, if Slick was within three inches of him when he was seriously injured, he would have to take a cool test. And if he failed that, he would become broken and he would run 2d6 looking for cover. That didn't come up in this scenario, but that is something to be aware of uh, for nerve tests. One of the other things that didn't come up in this tutorial that is pretty handy are group activations and your leader may activate two additional ready fighters within three inches of them at the start of their activation, and a champion may activate one in this manner. Uh, you've got to nominate all of your fighters who are going to be activated this way before they're, before they're activated, and then you must completely do the actions for one fighter before moving on to the next. This can be helpful if you've got guys grouped up around your leader or one around your champion and you would like to move two or even three people instead of just one. If you think it's going to give you an advantage, it is something to keep in mind. There are several more rules and things that I just couldn't cover without this turning into a really long video in which it already is. For example, injury dice, the difference between flesh wounds and serious injuries. I think all of that you can probably just read about. What my goal of this was is to give you an example of what the turns look like and how the game flows. And as you can see at its core, it is a very simple game, but you know when the rules really come into effect and it gets down into the nitty gritty, there's a lot of strategy and a lot of thinking that's done uh, every single time uh, that you activate a fighter. So really enjoyed playing this game and I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free to show your support with a like. If you'd like to see more of my content, feel free to subscribe, and if you would like to interact with me, feel free to leave a comment. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.